what a beautiful reminder that God's grace will always be greater than our sins. Thank you, Elder Curtis. Happy Sabbath, brethren. It's good to be in the house of God. Especially, you know, th these days I, I start to call myself. Normally I, would, uh, normally I would thank God at the end of the week, Sister Rosie. But these days I find myself telling God a special thanks at the end of the day. That I made it through the day. This week in two days I buried four individuals. Two of whom were my cousins, beloved cousins. And the other two were the Nemhards from, from Woodstock. And this coming week, I have, we have the, we have two, two this week. We have brother, brother Brown, brother Earl Brown on Tuesday. We have sister Vita, that's sister Hyacinth Davis on Thursday. And next week, when, on Friday, sorry, maybe it's because I wanted to be on Thursday. And then next week, next week, Wednesday, we have brother Paisley Carter. Now, for those persons who are interested in attending these burials, Sister Vita will be on Friday, right here in the, in the cemetery. So too will Brother Brown, his um, will be Tuesday at one o'clock in the cemetery. Sister Vita will be at 11 on Friday. And next week, Wednesday, Brother Carter, sorry, not next week, Wednesday, the following Wednesday, which is the 10th, Brother Carter will be at 11 o'clock at his family residence in, in, in um, Ramble. So for those persons who are interested in, in attending our, on a different note, members of the nominating committee, remember we meet this afternoon at 3.30 as we seek to begin the process for our church elections. Uh, I, 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 I wonder if Elder Curtis found the meditation song by virtue of today being Publishing Ministries Day. The song starts by saying, in holy pages, this truth can be found. <laughs> you see, the God we serve is, is an awesome God. He, he was a colporter. He was the first individual or the first one to start by setting the trend as to the importance of spreading the good news of salvation through the printed pages. And so the Lord started off by giving us the, the most awesome book we can ever imagine. The one that, is, that has sold more copies in more languages than any other book in the world. It is the book that is most despised and the book that is most loved in any language you can find. And that is the B-I-B-L-E. You know, as a child growing up, we used to sing this song, my B -I the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Now, I won't follow Elder Curtis and try to sing the song because I want all of us to be able to enjoy listening to pastor afterwards. And so today being Publishing Ministries Day, I considered a topic which I hope I can present on. The topic I considered this week was bringing hope into a dying world through the printed pages. Bringing hope to a dying world through the printed pages. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you have granted us the privilege to worship you today, unmolested, and we're truly grateful. We pray your blessings upon each of us, upon our viewers on social media, and even those who will watch today's service at a later date. May hearts be transformed, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. The work of the, let me, let me share with you quickly the importance or the role the publishing ministries department plays in the development of the church. 
the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jamaica. And I'm starting off by giving you some church history. This is something you can get from the internet. The, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jamaica dates from 1890. My great-grandfather was two years old at this point. 1890, when someone in Antigua sent a book, the title of the book, The Coming King. Who was the recipient? One Mr. James Palmer in Kingston. Palmer sought more material from the source of the book in Battle Creek, Michigan, USA. And sharing them with others, they started to study at one law street in Kingston, which with the help of several, with the help of per, oh, sorry, with the help from invited persons, the church's headquarters. The first Seventh-day Adventist church in Jamaica started with 37 members and was organized in 1894 at South Racecourse Road in Kingston. One book came to Jamaica. I know people like Elder Scott, I know this is, this is still information. One book came to Jamaica and in the house of Elder Palmer, the church started. Now the work grew rapidly, resulting in the naming of various organi organizational territories in the Caribbean, the West Indies in general, and Jamaica in particular. Two of these territories were, one, the Jamaica Conference, start, which started in 1903, then the West, Indian, the West Indian Union Conference, which started in 1906, the name West Indian Union, sorry, the name West Indies Union came into being in 1959. The Jamaica field itself grew with two distinct territories, the East Jamaica Conference with the parishes Kingston and St. And Kingston, St. Andrew, Portland, St. Mary, and St. Catherine. That was the, King, the East Jamaica Conference. And then the West Jamaica conferences had the parishes of St. Anne, Manchester, Clarendon, St. Elizabeth, St. James, Hanover, Trelawney, and Westmoreland. One book started the work in Jamaica. Today, today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church over the years has used various methods various methods to share the biblical message of salvation to the people. Public evangelistic series have, have, have been of help, as well as local evangelistic drives that the churches use from time to time to include a technique that should the church use this special form of evangelism with the printed pages, we would burst at our seams and this small method is called small group ministries. You see, the church started Elder Scott because of one book and a small group which met at the house or the home of Elder James Palmer. That's the reason why today we have the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Jamaica worshiping in over 200 congregations in Jamaica with more than 300,000 members on paper. The church has grown and continues to grow, but the work is still lagging because many of our members, Sister Gail, is not involved in the work of evangelism. Matthew tells us in Matthew 28, when we look at the Great Commission, verse 18 says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority, not some, not most, but all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he doesn't stop there, he says, Go. In other words, he says, since I have all authority, I am now giving it to you. Go. Go and do what? Go and make disciples of all nations. 
I became a Seventh day Adventist because of the printed pages that the churches have. Nobody studied with me. I was a strong member of the Mormon church. Enjoyed going to church on Sunday too. Guess why? Because when I go to church, church ends at midday, Elder Curtis. After church done, that's it until the following Sunday. I get to do anything I want to do after that. But my grandmother and grandfather were Seventh-day Adventists. Baptized in 1960, no, sorry, 1959. They taught us a few things as children growing up. And though my grandfather died in 1997, there were certain things that, that, he, that, that we were thought, taught that, that stuck with us through the ages. And one thing that stuck with me was one of the teachings of the Mormon church. That I was, that, and because of what my grandparents taught me, Sister Smith, it, it made me uneasy. So I started to search for truth. Being a Mormon, we believed in baptism for the dead. And it was practiced. But it did not sit well with me. And so I started to read. The first thing I got my hands on was a little book that to this very day, I think is one of the best books Mrs. White has written. The book Steps to Christ. And when I started to read about repentance and acceptance and salvation, I realized that what I believed as a Mormon was not adding up. And so one book led me to another book, which led me deeper into the Bible until eventually, thank God, the Seventh-day Adventist church around the same time I was reading, decided to have a 10th crusade in the area where I was living. The rest is history. Many Seventh-day Adventists today are, se many Christians who are part of the church today are Seventh-day Adventists, not because a Bible worker came and visited with them, but because they got a pamphlet or a book written by the Seventh-day Adventist church, which they read themselves into the church with. But gone are those days when the church would be embarking upon mass distribution programs, Gone are those days when priorities would be in the hands of every individual you see on the road. Or, or if it's not priorities, you, you, you have other magazines like Adventist World, ministry magazines, and for the, for the theological realm, you have Spectrum magazine and others. Gone are the days when the Mark Bible would be in the hands of every individual, when alone with God would be in the hands of every individual, when messages to young people would be in the hands of our young people. The church needs to get back, my brothers and sisters, to the days when we were known as a people of the word. We need to get back to the days when our Bible is on our study table with our quarterly, and next to the quarterly is one of the spirit of prophecy writings. Brethren, if we spend time in the word of God and in the spirit of prophecy, we will realize that many of the things happening around us, the word of God inspired in the Bible and through Sister White has foretold all of this a long time already. You know, I promised myself I was not going to touch this topic, but I can't help it. I keep asking myself the question, and I know, I know my, the view persons on YouTube might, might not agree with my statement, no, but I keep asking myself the question, how stupid can somebody be? Elder Joseph, when I listen to, when I listen to, the late Kevin Smith. I can't say bishop and I can't say pastor. Can't say, that's not a pastor. And I will never call him his excellency. I'm no idiot. When I listen to, bishop, to, to, to Kevin Smith and I, and you know the funny thing is, nobody knew anything about him until the sacrifice business. But since the sacrifice business elder Scott, there is so much that you have to take your time to decipher what do I watch now and I listen to the man and I, I listen when I heard the man say that he is God 
I said to myself, hold on the man. Did I hear him correctly? He didn't say, I am God's representative. He said, I am God. When I listen to some of the things the man talk about and some of the things the man claim, I ask myself the question, which Bible is, is his members reading? Brethren, brethren, let me tell you something. Don't be deceived. The same thing can happen in our church if we're not careful. Because, you see, the minute, brethren, we move away from the sacredness of the word and start to put the sacredness on the man, then we're in trouble. And in, in, in Kevin Smith's church, the Bible didn't take precedence, he did. What the Bible said wasn't important. What he said was law. Thank God for the Seventh-day Adventist church. We are still the church that believes in the word of God alone. The church may shift. Yes, it has. It may twist. It may turn. It may bob one and two times. But it still stands firm on the word of God. And as a Bible-believing church, we are called to bring hope into the homes of, of everybody we can come in contact with. When I tell people that you can't tell me the excuse anymore that oh, I can't afford the books, they're online. Oh, I told somebody, you know, I, I, somebody asked me recently, I, buy, I called Porter, as a matter of fact, said to me, Pastor, I realize you're not buying Sister White books. I said, don't, I said, don't do that. I said, don't do that. I said, you don't know what my library at home looks like. I said, you don't know, brethren, which book Sister White writes that I don't have. Because if I don't have it in printed copy, I promise it is on here. And let me go a little further. It's one thing to have it. It's another thing to use it. You know, the story was told of a, this, this, it's not a story, it's, a, it's, it's something that actually happened in, in the United States. Two pastors, two Seventh-day Adventist pastors, they were, they were doing their Doctor of Ministries degree. And so they decided to do their dissertation in the rapid growth, the exponential growth of two mega churches overseas. And so they arranged with the pastor of these mega churches to meet with him to find out from him what is your secret the sunday pastor took them into his vestry into his office sat them down opened the drawer on his desk and took out a book called evangelism written by ellen g white the other book, I think, was Christian Services, also written by Ellen G. White, and said, this is my secret. The man is using our material to grow his church. The church must go back to the days, brothers and sisters, like when George James Palmer got the first book. He ran with it. And the gospel in Jamaica spread like wildfire. No, we can boast that, oh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have one in every 10 members, one in every 10 Jamaicans is an Adventist. Or if one little bit further, we say these days, oh, we are the fastest growing denomination around the world. Yes, but what are you doing to help and aid the church in its growth? Brethren, publishing ministry does not include call porters only. The call porters are employed to do a particular job. And let me tell the call porters who might be watching, the call porter ministry is not about the money that you get from selling the books. The aim of call porter ministry is not for financial benefits. It's to get the good news into the homes of individuals. You don't need a lot of money to get the books into the hands of individuals. Some of these books cost no more than $100. Some of these 
Some of them, brethren, some of them, we have multiple copies of them at home resting, not doing a thing but growing moss and allowing Chichi to eat them out. The church needs to go back into the days when we get, you see, gone are the days when tent crusades run things. So if you think, say, we're going to go back to the day when you're going to pitch a tent down in Claremont and you preach for four weeks and baptize 200 persons, you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. Evangelism today will include you and I taking our Bibles in under our arms, a book in our hands, and going into the homes of individuals to share with them the good news of Jesus. So the same way the church started is the same way the work is going to end with the publishing work. I remember some years ago when I lived in Mandeville, we had a Jehovah's Witness neighbor. Well, the community, the part of Cedar Grove, I lived in. Almost every other house was Jehovah's Witness. Those who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses were Catholics and Mormons. I think about two houses in the entire area were served the Adventists, and those two houses are still Adventists today. And I remember when we became, when the church started to, started to impact the area, by this, I was personal missions director for the church and an elder, and I decided that I want us to spend time and resources in the community. So we, 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 we decided that, look, we're going to keep a crusade. Now, the worst thing you can do in an area like that is to, is to keep crusade. And so we, we, kept, we kept crusade, spent over a million dollars, and baptized not a soul. But what did the church do? We decided that we're going to go smart. And so we started every Sabbath evening, every Sunday, every Wednesday, a group of Adventists. Was, we were in the community with priorities in our hands. We were in the community with Signs of the Time magazines in our hands. We had Steps to Christ in our hands. And we were out every single Sunday, every Wednesday, and every Sabbath afternoon for at least an hour. And whether you were Jehovah's Witness or Catholic, we were coming to your house. Let me tell you something. We met a Jehovah's Witness at her shop one day, and when we were talking to her, she said to us, you cannot discuss the Bible with me at the shop. So I'm going to invite her to, our, to my house so you can come and dialogue with me. Let me tell you, Jehovah's Witness didn't invite no Christian to the yard to study the Bible. And they, we went... We studied, unfortunately, someone who had ulterior motive joined the group and the invitation we got was eventually rescinded. But we, we, we went to a certain, the same job was in the shop and when we went, the lady said to us, oh, she don't want the magazine, but then she said, but you can leave them on the counter, whoever comes can take them out. I said to her, you don't know that it's better you take the one magazine may I give you. That may put them on the shelf. Because guess what, brethren? I left about a hundred magazines. And about two or three days after, not eat. And this is the drama. Her magazines were also there, you know. And the same amount of magazines she had. When I went back, all of mine was gone, but all of hers was still there. And to this day, if you go to Green Street, I promise you, now you find more Seventh-day Adventists living there. The first crusade we went back after that, we baptized 85 persons. Why? Because we work through the method the Lord recommends, one-to-one, -one, the printed pages, house-to-house. -house. And though there are persons who are still hard-hearted, the work of God in that area continues to grow. When you look at Claremont and the amount of churches in Claremont, my brothers and sisters, pitching a tent is not going to work. Preaching feel-good sermons won't work. We need to get into the homes of individuals with the magazines and the books that will answer the questions that, we're gonna, that the persons are going to ask. Take with us some of the signs of the time magazines that explain the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. 
Because today, brethren, we are still the only denomination that can properly explain Daniel and Revelation. We are still the only denomination that when we compare Daniel and we point the people, we can show them how Daniel chapter 2 finds its fulfillment in Daniel chapter 7 or vice versa. Even the, even the so-called prophecy churches can't explain the prophecies and we have the material and sit down upon it. Claremont Church is not full today, not because of Corona, but because you and I have failed in our call to preach, teach, and baptize. I asked the question some time ago, and I'm going to ask the question again. Since you have been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, how many individuals have you deliberately pointed to Christ? Brethren, the Lord is not going to come and ask us how many so much we went to church, you know. The Lord is not going to ask us how much offering and tithe we give him. He's going to want to know how many souls did you bring with you? Currently, Adventist publishing ministries include at least three areas. First, regular and student literature evangelists who work hard at door to door. Secondly, church members who purchase books, read them, nurture their own faith, and then give them away. And thirdly, every church member participates in massive distribution of missionary books every year. The truth is the church has provided a means where individuals can better themselves financially and otherwise. Because if you are a call porter, not only are you spreading the gospel, but you're also making some money for your pocket. By the way, did you know that in, this, in, in the church, the only job a pastor can do outside of preaching in the, or outside of pastoral work is called a ministry. A pastor can leave Jamaica, go overseas, go sell book and come back, you know. But here's the joke. We can take vacation and go overseas, go sell book and come back, or go sell book right here in Jamaica. Uh, uh, but if you take vacation and go overseas, go to cruise in the church, fine, or they get fired. Because you're, you, have to, uh, you have to be authorized to do that. If you as a pastor decide one day that you're going to open a car mart and the church finds out you lose your job because that's called moonlighting, we are not permitted to work outside of the organization and that is the reason why none of us don't have job, second jobs. The most you will find us doing people like myself is that we teach whether at the school or the university because we're still being paid by the same organization. But Cole Porter ministry is one of those things, brothers and sisters, that the church highly recommends. Now I ask the question, how many Cole Porters do we have in Claremont Church? Don't answer. How many of us this week gave away one book? Don't answer. How many of us this week gave away one priority magazine? Don't answer. Brethren, the same way how the church grew between 1890 when we started in Kingston and 2021 when we are right across the entire island is the same way the church can grow if we em employ the same methods and build on them. And let me tell you something, if we decide, my brothers and sisters, you see, this is the reason why I, don't, I, I like to preach from paper. See me there, so I screw up on my Bible. If, you, if, you, if we decide that we're going to work with God, we don't have to worry about having the means. Because Matthew tells us, all authority has been given to us by God. And if we have all authority given to us by God, then we are the commissioned to go out and to make disciples. How do we make disciples? By introducing them to God. By introducing them to God. And the easiest way to do that is to give someone a piece of literature 
And let me tell you something about giving literature. Make sure you know what is in it before you give it away. Because though it is used to bring others to Jesus, it is to help you and I to become better Christians today. Every quarter, the church provides for its members, whether you pay for it or not, the church provides for every single member from the toddler to the 101 year old. We provide Bible study guides so that we can study and know the word of God and then share it with others. But many of us don't open the quarterly. But can I tell you that if you have a quarterly at home that is in good condition, even if it's an old quarterly, it is still one of the best gifts to give someone. Because it introduces individuals not to the ideologies of the Adventist church, but to the word of God. To the word of God. A vital part of the church's mission, brethren, at this crucial time in Earth's history is to circulate literature as never before. In, in 1849, James White set the example by distributing copies of the present truth. The first Adventist publication. Today, God's people, today, God's call for his people's involvement in literature circulation is as valid as ever. Again, every believer is called upon to scatter and broadcast tracts, leaflets, and books containing the messages of this time. We are called to do that. You might not be able to preach like Elder Scott but you can read a book. You can share a book with someone. You can share a book with someone. Today, God's, God calls for workers from every church among us to enter his service as canvassing evangelists. We are called by God to bring hope into every home. We are called by God to bring hope into every home. Can I tell you, my brothers and sisters, this is the time to preach the gospel through our publications. As long as we have this opportunity, we must share every book and magazine available with other people. Soon, the time will come when we will lose our freedom to preach in churches, when we will lose our freedom to have small group ministry or any, or, or to preach in any other place, but the silent messenger will still be preaching in the homes of, the, of individuals through the influence of the Holy Spirit. Somebody who you gave a book 10 years ago, who might have put the book on the shelf and forgot about it, Elder Curtis will one day be cleaning the bookshelf and see in the spine of the book the title that, that answers the question they're asking and will read the book and come to Jesus. They will find out about God's love and the living truths of his word. We will be surprised, my brothers and sisters, at the results the printed pages will bring to the church. And so today as I close, I want to remind us it is time for church members to nurture themselves through our publications. It is time for us to read. You see, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I was, I was a little youngster in my early teens. And my mother at the time thought that as soon as school went on break, Summer should, summer should be spent reading. And so when I, was, when, when I wanted to be outside, Elder Scott playing marble and playing cricket. I never liked football and still don't like football. So I don't play football. But when I wanted to be outside playing cricket, I couldn't bat, but, as a, but I was a wicked spins bowler. And my friends outside and I can hear, I can hear right at the window. I can hear the phone and I had to be locked in the house reading evangelism. I had to be locked in the house reading patriarchs and prophets and prophets and kings. So much so that in one week I finished three books and I did books. I, did, I had 
I hide every single book with mommy gone. But guess what happened? Thank God for Jesus. Here I am today because of the things I learned while reading. Parents, it is still important to give your young children and teenagers the book, Messages to Young People. If our children were reading the book, Messages to Young People, then they would know that as Seventh-day Adventist young people, our dress code is important. Because Mr. White speaks to dress and decorum in the book. They will know that as Seventh-day Adventist young people, you don't date people who are outside of the church. Because the church has enough people, the church has enough single people where if you want a spouse, that there is one for you in the church. And let me tell you something: the person might not be at Claremont, they might be at Golden Grove. They might be at Harmony Vale, and maybe not in Claremont District any at all. They might be at Hampton in Montego Bay, or Cedar Grove in Mandeville, or East, or, 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 or Kings in Kingston, or maybe they were Pope Maria. But they are in the church. Let me go a little bit further. A Seventh-day Adventist who spends time as young, our young people, you will know that the book Steps to Christ also speaks to the whole issue of money management. We will know that as young people, the way you groom yourself is also important as it relates to how you worship God. You see, when I look at our young people these days, not, and not just our young people, because of our adults are doing it too. When you go to church, God, you can't look down. Because should you look down, you're going to see what the Lord kept reserved for the person's husband alone. Gone are the days, brothers and sisters, when our church, our sisters would be known by the way they look. This today, breasts, leg, and thighs. Flaunting all over in God's face, and we think it is okay. But Sister White helps us to understand that it is not acceptable. It is time for church members to nurture themselves through our publication in order to strengthen their faith in God and then share the publication with other people. The book Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students is a book that every Seventh-day Adventist teacher should have. Is a book every Seventh-day Adventist student should have. It's a book that every Seventh-day Adventist parent should have. The book Adventist Home is a book that all Seventh-day Adventist families should be reading. The book Great Controversy is a book all of us should be reading because we are at the end of time. We are, we are in the closing moments of Earth's history let us strengthen our faith brethren by spending time reading the inspired writings of the men and women who god has ordained in the seventh day adventist church our literature carrying the message of salvation must alert humanity with the news that jesus is coming soon so people are to prepare to meet him. The great and wonderful work of the last gospel message is to be carried on now as it has never been before. The world is to receive the light of truth through an evangelizing, an evangelizing ministry of the word in our books and periodicals. Our publications are to show that the end is at hand. That the end of all things is at hand. I pray, my brothers and sisters, that all of us will be converted enough to realize the urgency in the need to share the word with God. I'm sorry, to share the word of God with a dying word. To go back to the days when the song might be ideally 
meant, it means something to us. Go back to the day when we realize and, and, and see the significance of the song we used to sing as children. Read your Bible and pray every day and you grow, grow, grow. Neglect your Bible and forget to pray. And you you see, as children, we also physically think we're going to grow, but it's not physical growth. It is spiritual growth, which is even more important than physical growth. So though you might be short as Elder Curtis or tall like Brother Brian, don't worry yourself. When you read your Bible and pray on a daily basis, you will grow spiritually to be giants in the land. So I challenge you, my brothers and sisters, share the word of God in season and out of season. Be diligent to present the word of God to your brothers and sisters, to your neighbors and your friends, so that they will know that the end is near. I challenge you the authority of God to work because the night is coming. God bless you. Amen.